Americans as a group can be led to war quite easily. But they can't be kept at war for very long unless they believe that the war is theirs. And we'll see how the situation in Iraq turns out because we're kind of on the cusp. Americans were willing to follow George W. Bush into Iraq, but it was his idea. There was no groundswell of American opinion behind a war in Iraq. But the president thought it was a good idea and brought Congress on board and the public was willing to go along and gave President Bush uh, a very ambivalent pat on the back and seal of approval in the election of 2004. Close victory. Um, but certainly the Democratic Party has come out against the war. We'll see how it plays out in the election to come. So if popular opinion diminishes, then George W. Bush will be seen as another Lyndon Johnson who led the country unnecessarily in an unpopular war. So anyway, other questions? Yes. If we examine your half-step principle in your first lecture mm -hmm. and transpose the Wilsonian thing to, to Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam and to George Bush in Iraq, are, could it be that they were a full step ahead of the Iraqi or the Vietnamese and the Iraqis as well as the American people? The question of how far you how far ahead a leader can be is central to understanding American politics and the successes and failures of American initiatives, especially in foreign policy. So the question is, was Lyndon Johnson too far ahead of the American people in Vietnam? And, and, and George W. Bush, too far ahead of the American people in Iraq? We don't know. In the case of Johnson and Vietnam, historical opinion now, and historical opinion does change, but historical opinion now would say, it's not that he was too far ahead, it was that he was stepping in the wrong direction. And this is why you have to wait for the historians and history to catch up and tell you how it all turns out. Because when you're only a half step ahead of the American people, then you get a pretty good idea if you're going in the right direction. But when you get a full step ahead, you don't know if history is going to change before it catches up with you. George W. Bush certainly hopes that he is simply ahead of American public opinion and ahead of the course of world events. Because when you get that far ahead, you're making a prediction on how the world is going to unfold. It's a risky business. And as I said, I think yesterday, if the war in Iraq turns out as President Bush has intimated that it will, and certainly as he wants it to, then historians like me will acknowledge that George W. Bush was the great visionary of the early 21st century. He was the Wilson of his age. He saw something that other people, that his contemporaries did not see. Because if you polled most experts on the Middle East and asked, what are the chances of democracy in the Middle East? They would say slim to none. But George Bush thought that there was, thinks that there is a possibility. And if it turns out as he predicts and hopes, then yes, he will go down as one of those very far-sighted presidents, as great at least as Harry Truman. Okay. But if he turns out to be wrong, then he will be seen as a fool. And not only a fool, but someone who wasted American resources, American lives, and probably made things worse. And this is a gamble presidents take. And you know, in, at the moment, we're all kind of guessing in the dark. And I don't think that historians have a great deal more to offer in the way of predicting than anybody else, than any other sort of careful student of the times. Because every event today is like events in the past, but also different from events in the past. And we never know until we see how it all turns out whether the similarities or the differences are the more important. How we, no, Cleves, yes. There's a struggle over the interpretation of Ronald Reagan in the end of the Cold War. You bet. To what extent is he a true visionary that sees that, that communism is going to end up, uh, you know, on the ash heap of history, to turn Marx's words against him? And to what extent is he aided and abetted by events beyond his control? I mean, that the left and the right have been banding this about. What's your opinion? Presidents succeed when they identify the direction of history.
The American president, the president of the United States, is arguably the most powerful person on Earth. But the Earth is a big place. There are six and a half billion people on Earth and there are only 300 million Americans. As powerful as an American president can be, presidents do not dictate the course of world history. At the most, they give history a slight nudge. But the ones who are the most successful are the ones who see where history is going and give it the timely nudge. Would the Soviet Union have collapsed had Ronald Reagan never been president? I think the answer is yes. I think that there were tensions and contradictions intrinsic in the Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist model of social organization. Would it, would it have collapsed when it did in the absence of Ronald Reagan? I think not. I think Reagan gave an important nudge to the Soviet Union at a time when it was vulnerable. I, I don't profess to be an expert on Soviet economics or Soviet politics, but looking at records that have become available since the end of the Cold War, it's hard for me to imagine that the Soviet model would have survived another generation. Okay? But 1989, 1991, 1999, that does depend on individuals. And here I'm going to deliver a prediction as to what historians of the future are going to say about another president. And I will confess that I have a soft spot in my heart for the elder George Bush because, because of my Bush school connection. I, have a, I had occasion to speak to George Bush, the elder George Bush, on a num, on, in a number of events. And I, have, I thought at the time, and I have really had this belief confirmed since then, that what happened during the presidency of the first George Bush is grossly underappreciated, undervalued by the American people at the time and by historians since. And I have spoken to, I did an interview once with George Bush and Brent Scowcroft. These are really the two guiding spirits of the Bush administration, the first Bush administration's foreign policy. And they both modestly and quietly but firmly made the point that the Cold War didn't end by itself and it didn't end peacefully on its own. A lot of really bad things could have happened when the Soviet Union imploded. In fact, if you had done a poll of international relations experts, of political scientists, of historians in 1985, and you had said, okay, suppose the Soviet Union disintegrates in the next decade, what are the consequences of that gonna be? Nearly everyone would have said, a bloody civil war within the Soviet Union, probably spilling over into Eastern Europe and perhaps sucking in the United States and NATO. None of that happened. And it didn't happen just by accident. It didn't happen in large part because American foreign policy was in the hands of somebody who was exceedingly adept, actually a group of people who were exceedingly adept at balancing American power, American influence, knowing when to push, when to back off, knowing not to gloat when the Soviet Union was beginning to disintegrate because they knew that that would simply put cards in the hands of those people in the Soviet Union who were opposing these changes. And here, I'll say one other thing about the nature of presidential leadership. 